All right, kicking off uh, the week before the election, 30 minutes of uh, until the start of trading. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. And coming up, the next 10 days could be make or break for investors. There's a slew of big earnings, a Fed decision, the election, and more on the horizon. And Volkswagen closing three factories in Germany, cutting worker pay by 10%, shrinking the rest of its operations as the automaker struggles to compete on costs with China. Meanwhile, Boeing launching a nearly $19 billion share sale that would help the beleaguered plane maker boost its liquidity. All that and more coming up. But let's take a look at where markets are trading 30 minutes until those bells ring. You can see a lot of green on the screen behind me. Of course, we did have a down week last week, breaking several weeks of gains, but bouncing back a bit this morning. The S&P 500 up about six tenths of a percent. It is a big week for tech. You have the Nasdaq 100 rallying ahead of that up about eight tenths of a percent. And the bond market the level is high but right now the action is quiet pretty much unchanged on your 10-year treasury yield have we mentioned that it's one week and one day I until know. the u.s presidential election i've got here uh the trump trade in red and i guess the harris trade in blue we've been watching this very closely we all know that they've diverged with trump uh the trump trade really taking over but the question is how much does this really have in terms of any bearing on what we really get as a result on November 5th, November 6th, or maybe later on in the week? It could take a while to decide who actually wins next you week. You see it in the bond market, you see it in the stock market, but again, like you said, a week to go. But until that moment, we see DJT shares just soaring this morning after that rally yesterday in New York City. It's up more than 8% today, and you have to remember the shares have already tripled in the five weeks since a lockup period for the biggest shareholders had Expired. Many considering the stock an election betting proxy. We're also watching shares of Boeing. It is actually down now, almost 2% pre-market. It finally announced that long-awaited share sale valued at upwards of $19 billion. And it's to avoid that credit downgrade. We're also taking a look here at ExxonMobil. We see a drop in oil prices on concerns around the Middle East. Israel struck Iran military targets over the weekend, but they did not strike those oil facilities there. And you do see that risk premium hopping off the oil market, but you are seeing energy stocks down in conjunction, 2.6% lower pre-market, Matt. All right, we'll be watching those oil stocks as well. Um, Donald Trump held a six-hour rally at Madison Square Garden yesterday, um, you know, promising more tax cuts if you're mm -hmm. helping taking care of your ailing parents. Also, uh, I guess some of the openers trashing Puerto Rico. Um, yes. Which is not a great move, usually, in New York City. He did use the word garbage, didn't he? So, yeah. literally trash. It was a comedian. So, right, you right. You know, and it, not, you know, working directly for the Trump campaign, but <laughs> doesn't seem like a, a smart look. Anyway, we have corporate news that really seems to eclipse that, believe yes. it or not. Yeah, we have... One story you've been watching pretty closely. Boeing, I've been watching it closely. Of course, the news coming on Friday. They're considering uh, selling off their space business. I've been watching that. That's according to people familiar. And then today, this is what we've been waiting for. Of course, they need to boost liquidity. We know that they, uh, you know, filed for that shelf registration for a share sale. And we got the news this morning. Interesting to see the stock reaction. Traders not quite sure what to do with it. Yeah, it is interesting because on one hand, it's dilution, right? On the other hand, it's money on the sidelines and they don't have that junk rating. Another thing to watch out for, I know we're going to be talking a lot about earnings. And Katie, you had this great point last week about companies outperforming more than usual when you look at the ones that have outperformed. But great analysis by Bloomberg Intelligence as well that the beats are coming at the lowest rate in nearly two years. I know we're going to talk a lot about those expectations. It's still 75% of companies, of course, beating estimates. But still, it speaks to the price for perfection nature of this market that that's not quite enough. But of course, given that it is a huge earnings week, you have almost half of the S&P 500 reporting over the next 10 days. Let's walk through the results so far with Bloomberg's Denitsa Sekova. And let's keep the conversation going. I mean, you had seen the market rewarding those companies that were beating uh, expectations, but now you're seeing the degree to which that reward is lessening a little bit. Yeah, at the beginning of the earnings season, it seems like beats were rewarded very well. Even, even the companies that missed weren't punished that badly. Uh, obviously, what we're seeing now is a big reversal from that trend. Uh, but of course, this week is the busiest one. 42% uh, of the companies are expected to report 
all the big names expe ex uh, expect uh, no, no NVIDIA, of course, we have to wait another month, but we're seeing all the companies that work with NVIDIA, uh, so we're definitely going to see a lot of uh, reasons there. Uh, also, we're expected to see tech earnings around 90%, which sounds great, 90% growth, but what we see in the past is in the ranks of 32%. So some analysts are worried that that Magnificent Seven and that tech that has been driving the rally maybe seems a little bit of slowdown. Hmm. What about the S&P 493? I mean, we've been hearing so much about the broadening out and there has been a rotation, at least the beginnings of one. Are they really proving their worth in terms of um, an earnings recovery? We've seen broadly uh, a lot of companies being rewarded for good earnings outside of the S&P 500. And we've seen really that rally has been broadening out for quite some time. Of course, when you look at the multiples at the uh, Nasdaq 100, it's really a really big gap that's starting to close. But you can imagine that either, uh, for example, small caps or mid caps have a lot of catching up to do, uh, or it's really those big 10, top 10 names um, are potentially up for some pain to really close that big gap between uh, the winners and the losers. And this comes a, in a week with a lot of volatility. We saw the move uh, jump at the highest, at the fastest pace since the pandemic. The VIX bond market volatility. The bond market volatility. We saw stock market volatility around 20. Mm. So investors are worried. Denita, we thank you so much. We have to see if that bond market volatility turns into that stock market volatility. We're going to discuss this all further with BMO Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer, Young Yu Ma. And we were talking a little earlier about 10 days, so many catalysts. You have the election, a Fed meeting, and also most of the companies here, about 42% of the S&P 500's market cap coming out with earnings in the next couple of days alone. What are the next set of catalysts and are they upside or downside catalysts here? Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. There is a tremendous amount of things going on all at once here. And we think there are multiple catalysts here, of course, uh, the election and earnings. If we look further out into 2025, though, I think it's also worth taking a step back and thinking what the broader market catalysts are. And of course, the Fed continuing to lower interest rates is going to be uh, relevant for the market and continue to provide a positive backdrop. Uh, we think earnings are going to be healthy. And we actually think 2025 is going to be the story of business investment uh, accelerating and also productivity continuing to come in strongly and provide companies the ability to increase profits uh, and have operating leverage. And let's zero in on earnings here because you take a look at the, over the next two days at, or 10 days rather, plenty to pick from. But we're talking about Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Meta, all reporting over the next couple days here. You think about the narrative of last earnings season, second quarter earnings season. It was this frustration among investors that they're not seeing the payoff from that big, big spend that we're seeing on AI, billions and billions of dollars. What do you think the narrative around that spending will be this quarter? That is a very big question, and that's something that is going to point to, I think, whether or not investors start to settle into the idea that the payoff from uh, AI is just going to take uh, not just multiple quarters, but multiple years, and there's a lot of spending that goes into it. I think all of these companies are committed to the spending, and that's going to come through strongly and benefit other tech companies, of course, semiconductor companies, uh, but broadly, it's going to benefit infrastructure spending in a lot of areas of the economy. Uh, but whether or not investors react uh, negatively when they see these big spending numbers come out, especially if these mega cap tech companies accelerate spending, not just keep up the current pace, I think that's an open question because that does, uh, that does point to whether or not, broadly speaking, investors think that the gains from AI will be real uh, over the coming couple of years. So that's what we're looking for, to see what that reaction is when the, these big spending numbers are announced. All right. So... Generally, um, good news, a positive outlook, Young Yu, that we're going to have more corporate spending. Um, they're going to be building up their AI abilities, these big companies, with billions and billions of dollars to support the U.S. economy. Is the Fed going to continue to cut rates, do you think? I mean, everything seems pretty rosy right now. Things are looking rosy. We think the Fed's probably on autopilot for the next two meetings for this coming uh, upcoming November meeting and then the December meeting as well, probably on autopilot with a 25 basis point cut at each of those meetings. But the big question mark does come into 2025, and we'll have to see what happens with the labor market, and we'll have to see what happens with the election. 
and how fiscal policy and stimulus is coming together, I think probably the market is a bit more optimistic about the number of rate cuts uh, that are possible in 2025 than will actually happen, uh, at least under given outcomes uh, that, that look at least uh, to have high potential right now. So uh, right now we sell the Fed providing a positive backdrop, but uh, that could moderate as we move through 2025. So if there's so much uncertainty still out there, what would you characterize as the tone of your clients at this juncture? Are they more risk on or risk off? Are they waiting till we get past some of these catalysts to put real money to work? A lot of clients are cautious and we've been recommending not to be as cautious as that gut reaction or, or, or knee jerk feeling might, uh, might be about whether it's the elections, uh, you know, seeing how uh, the earnings season plays out. We do think the overall backdrop is healthy. We think uh, the overwhelming majority of election outcomes are at least neutral uh, for the markets and not going to be damaging for the market. So we've been recommending continuing to put cash to work for investors that have cash on the sidelines. But there is that gut feeling of why not just wait? Why not just stay out of the market? But as we've seen, uh, over the past several months, just staying out of the market itself can be uh, uh, can be costly. And just quickly here, uh, it's interesting you bring up cash. We've been having this conversation for weeks. When you're trying to coax your clients out of cash, I mean, how difficult is that at this juncture? Well, it's a little bit easier now, given that the short-term interest rates are coming down. The Fed has not only started off with that 50 basis point cut, but it's continuing to cut rates. Some of that is already getting priced in to what they can earn on cash. So the conversations are getting easier to coax investors into the market um, that do have cash on the sidelines, but uh, the yields are still attractive uh, when, when you can pick up four plus percent uh, just by sitting on it and inflation is uh, running at about two and a half percent. Some people take comfort in that, but we do think next year still has a positive backdrop in the equity markets and is favorable for taking risk here. All right, Young Yu Ma from BMO Wealth Management, thanks very much for joining us. We're going to watch these markets today uh, as futures um, look to signal a higher open right now. Just uh, got about 18 minutes until the market opens. We're going to spend some time today talking about corporate stories that really matter to this market, matter to this economy. Boeing being uh, first and foremost this morning after it launches a nearly $19 billion share sale to address liquidity needs amid a crippling strike. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get to high interest now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. Oil tumbles after Israeli strikes against targets in Iran avoided. OPEC crude facilities, Israeli jets struck military targets across Iran over the weekend, delivering a vow to retaliate for a missile barrage at the beginning of the month. The attack, though, was more restrained than expected and avoided oil as well as nuclear and civilian infrastructure targets that's in line with requests from the U.S. government and offers the markets a little bit of uh, relief. Indonesia is blocking Apple from selling its latest iPhone in Southeast, in the Southeast Asia's largest economy, saying the company has not met local investment requirements. The industry ministry said earlier this month that the tech giant has only invested $95 million in the country. That's below the company's initial commitment. It's a road bump for Apple, which has enjoyed healthy initial sales of its flagship products in other Asian markets like China, for example. And Boeing is launching a nearly $19 billion share sale meant to address its liquidity needs and stave off a potential credit rating downgrade to junk. The new CEO is grappling with a balance sheet strained by years of turmoil and the fallout from a strike that's now in its seventh week that is crippling manufacturing of the company's main cash cow, the 737 Max Jetliner. Boeing needs that cash infusion to maintain its investment grade rating and fund its production ramp up once the walkout ends, if, Chanali, it ever does. Certainly still a lot of uncertainty, but one off the table with that share sale being announced. And for more on it, we are joined by Sid Phillip, Bloomberg's deputy editor for Global Aviation. And it's interesting, there was a lot of anticipation around this share sale. The market generally knew it was coming. We finally have the details. The stock reaction, at least initially, is lower. What are investors 
slightly disappointed by here? Uh, at the moment, everyone's sort of looking to see what the uptake's going to be in terms of the share sale and also what the sort of what the future prospects for the company are. Because while they are sort of raising cash, the, the immediate prospects for Boeing are still pretty bleak. They aren't able to generate cash. They're expecting to burn through another $4 billion in the fourth quarter. And that will take that 2024 cash burn to about $14 billion. And they've guided that there will be further cash burn. So in the first half of next year, they're also talking about how they'll have to burn through cash. So for Boeing to actually start generating cash and actually start sort of sort of return on that investment is going to be a while. And I think that's what investors are slightly skeptical about, especially since the strike keeps going. Especially, too. And uh, it's a great point on uptake, given that this is the largest share sale for any company since 2020. So uh, a lot of question marks there about demand. I want to talk about some of the news from last week, though, that basically Boeing has uh, started a review of its businesses. One of the businesses that they're weighing options for is the future of its space business. And when you think about what they should maybe spin out or sell here, it feels like the space business could be a no-brainer. Yeah, at the moment it's actually sort of it's it's open season at Boeing because I mean they've got so many different issues that they need to grapple with that it's really difficult for them to sort of uh, focus on other core non-core businesses. I mean Boeing's biggest sort of cash generator is their commercial aircraft business, and that should be sort of the focus for the company. And the CEO is sort of trying to focus on back to basics and sort of focusing on their commercial business. And so he has talked about how the company is looking at various options. They haven't really talked about space. I mean, space is uh, famous for its the two astronauts who were stranded in the International Space Station because of their Starliner uh, essentially not being up to snuff. And so for Boeing, this is really a, a make or break moment. They have to sort of get a, a, a grip across different businesses, different divisions, and they're all the while they're burning cash. Sid, what, what is the problem with a company like Boeing being seemingly completely unable to compete with a company like SpaceX. Is it um, just too much, I mean, too old, uh, maybe too much bureaucracy? Is there anything Kelly Ortberg could possibly do about that, or is it better just to get out of this business completely if you have much more uh, nimble competitors out there? Uh, I mean, that's a billion-dollar question, and I think Kelly Ortberg will be the only one who can actually answer that question as to what he sees the future of the space business. I mean, Boeing's got a, they've got multiple fires at, across different businesses, and at the moment, their core sort of focus is on sort of bringing back production. I mean, the strike's now in the seventh week, and the workers have rejected uh, two offers from the company. And so at, at this point, the company is looking at ways that they can actually get production back on track. They can start generating cash with the 737 MAX, and then sort of then they can focus on the other sort of parts of it. But at the moment, they've got multiple fires. And for Boeing, they really need to sort of get their heads around how they get the company out of the hole that they're in at the moment. With this production shortfall, let's call it, and with the strikes, I feel like, Sid, you always have the numbers in your back pocket here. How much money is at stake for Boeing the longer this uncertainty goes on? I mean... Again, the sort of the, the spending, the, the company is expected to burn through 50 to 100 million dollars a day as 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 the strike goes on, and so it is really a quest, big question as to when the strike ends, when they can actually get a deal with the workforce, and what that deal actually costs the company, because that is a sort of ex, a really ex, expensive proposition. The workers have asked for a return to a defined benefits pension that could cost the company a lot of money, and the company has so far rejected that, and so at the moment it is. It depends on how long the strike lasts. And remember, you can't actually start production immediately. It will be a gradual ramp up to back to where they were before the surge strike. And the company was producing a lower rate as, uh, before, as compared to last year when they had that whole blowout at the start of the year. And the FAA reg restricted them from raising production beyond 38 a month. So lots of fires, lots of issues. I mean, the quality issues, they've got workforce issues, they've got cash issues. And so Ortberg's got a big sort of mandate to try and sort of get this company back on track.
Well, it's a gift that keeps on giving for the reporters covering it. Bloomberg's Sid Phillip, really appreciate your time. Of course, Boeing shares down about 40% year to date. You compare that to their uh, closest competitor, Airbus. Airbus shares only up about 2%, a good reminder, of course, that even with all this pain that Boeing is going through, it's not immediate good news necessarily for Airbus. Of course, these contracts are signed so far in advance that uh, it's not like Airbus can immediately swoop in here. But coming up, McDonald's bringing back the quarter pounder back to the menu without those slivered onions. Details next in Social Climbers. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves this morning and first up, Amazon said to be in talks to lease space on Fifth Avenue as more workers return to the office. The tech giant recently told its employees it wants them back in the office five days a week, and this expansion would put Amazon staff next door to its Manhattan headquarters. Next up, we have Sunrun in discussions with data center developers to supply solar power generation for their facilities. Now, the potential collab here illustrates the race among developers and energy companies to find new power resources for AI demands. And finally, the beef is back. McDonald's says the Quarter Pounders will return to menus at all restaurants this week after ruling out beef patties as the source of a multi-state E. coli outbreak that sickened dozens and left one person dead. The infections appear to stem from the slivered onions served on top of the burger, and these burgers will not have any onions. You can follow all the latest company buzz on TREN Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Meanwhile, let's take a check on futures here. Of course, just a couple minutes until the bells ring. You can see green on the screen after that down week that we saw last week. The S&P 500 up about half a percent. Big tech leading the market slightly when it comes, of course, to the benchmarks up about six tenths of a percent on the NASDAQ 100. Small caps, great day so far. Hasn't even started, but the Russell 2000 up about nine tenths of a percent. This is Bloomberg. We are just moments away from the start of trading. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. Futures are really ripping, actually. S&P futures up six tenths of one percent. Nasdaq futures up about the same. So it's not just the big tech drivers on uh, the benchmark index. Russell 2000 futures up eight tenths of one percent. You hear the opening bell uh, down on the New York Stock Exchange, um, as well as the Nasdaq market site covenant ringing at the new york stock exchange down at the nasdaq uh, market site we have the american bankers association um, it does look like katie greifeld that we're going to get a bit of a lift today i'm not sure if we'll get another record high on the s p 500 but it's interesting that even ahead of the election we're getting close to that again nothing can stop this bull market it certainly seems that's the case matt miller you take a look of course where we're trading just a couple seconds into the u.s day as you said i mean it's pretty much dead even between the s p 500 and the nasdaq 100 different than what we saw pre-market those two indexes leveling out ahead of a very hefty week for tech earnings we know that but at least your early leader on this trading week on this monday are those small caps the russell 2000 of about eight tenths of a percent we'll see if if these gains hold, of course, the S&P 500 snapped a six week winning streak last week. We'll see what this week's hold this week holds rather. Let's take a look under the surface. Trump Media and Technology shares DJT is the ticker there, extending gains on the heels of yesterday's rally at Madison Square Garden, where Trump supporters, including Hulk Hogan and Elon Musk campaigns. Shares have more than tripled in the past five weeks. We know that the stock has kind of turned into a proxy on Trump's odds. And at least right now, Shanali shares currently higher by about 7.4%. Katie, I also have an election-related stock. It is not what you think. I am watching shares of Robinhood. They're higher on the news that they will let users bet on certain events, particularly the presidential election. You have Robinhood now up 2.3% as the market opens. We're going to bring you more on that later this hour. All right, finally, let's check in on shares of Alphabet ahead of earnings tomorrow. It's a huge week for earnings for the Magnificent Seven with Alphabet, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, and Apple reporting even uh 
though NVIDIA doesn't come out for a month, as Katie um, has been pointing out this morning, a lot of its customers are reporting this week, and we'll get some CapEx uh, expectations from them. Let's discuss the expectations of Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. Mandeep, um, we had a guest at the top who said, look, it's all about business spending, and these are the companies that are doing the bulk of it. Do you expect good outlooks in terms of CapEx? I mean, the more CapEx uh, is something that used to put pressure on the stocks. Right now, everyone is treating them positively because these companies are at the forefront of building these large language models which underpin the entire, you know, Gen AI wave. And uh, look, I, I think they've been able to show some of the ROI. So in the case of Microsoft, they have quantified the Gen AI lift. It's seven percentage points through their Azure growth. If they come out and say it's 10 percentage points now, I think that those are the data points you need to validate that Gen AI is contributing. By, and by the way, Young Yuma yeah. from BMO, who was talking to us at the top, pointed out the dissimilarities between 1999 and now in that the companies back then had no money, right? And they were posting losses. These companies have hundreds of billions of dollars in free cash. It, there, there is, I mean, uh, the balance sheets look really healthy, but the question is, how much are they going to spend in the next year and uh, next two, three years? Because the scaling laws, when it comes to these large language models, they continue to hold. So the next training run for, uh, you know, a GPT or a Google Llama is going to cost even two to three times more than what it did for their prior models. So from that perspective, the investments continue to ramp up. And uh, it will be interesting to see if all of them maintain their CapEx guide in terms of raises or one of them says, I don't want to spend right now. And Apple has been the wild card when it comes to the CapEx. They have not increased their CapEx at all. And still they are talking about deploying AI. You know, you kind of hinted at this, that it's not just the amount they spend, it's the return on the investment of that spending. And the biggest run up in stocks that you've seen out of this group was actually Meta. And are people happy with what they're getting back in return? I, I think compared to what they were getting with reality lab spend, <laughs> with AI, clearly I think the narrative has changed completely. And I wouldn't be surprised if Meta comes out and says they are raising their CapEx guide. But at the same time, they've shown how their CapEx investments have helped on the Reels front, on the content recommendation front. So investors are okay, even if Reality Labs continue to lose $18 billion, which I, I think if they were to curtail back, that would be positive for the stock. But clearly, the AI front is working very well for them. So two points here. Uh, it's interesting to me that we're having a CapEx discussion, and we haven't brought up the function SPLC. <laughs> you can see, of course, uh, who NVIDIA's customers are in that group that we mentioned, about 40% of NVIDIA sales in the second quarter. But I want to keep talking about Meta here, because Peter Bufar, he had a really interesting note this morning talking about that scrutiny on the AI spend. He said that Meta's core business is so solid that it's probably less under under the microscope than Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon. Do you agree with that? Talk to us a little bit about the core business of Meta relative to that AI spend. I mean, look, the last four quarter, the comps were very easy. So they were able to put those 20% plus growth numbers. The comps do get tougher in the second half and for next year. So from that perspective, ads is still a much more cyclical business. When it comes to all the other big tech names, they're so well diversified. To me, Meta is still indexed entirely to ads, and that's where you know there will be a cyclical element. The Ray-Ban glasses are uh, catching up, so at least they have something to share. You're familiar with them. I, I am, and look, I, I think that's a good form factor. So if you're talking about deploying AI as a virtual agent, the glasses are a very good form factor. So at least they have had some success on the hardware side, but it's still an ads-focused company. There's no doubt about it. All right, a good place to leave it. Mandeep Singh, appreciate your time. That is Mandeep from Bloomberg Intelligence. Katie, you know I tried to get Tell me. a pair of those Ray-Ban Metas. Last week, I thought, I had seen Mandeep's, and I want to make videos of, you know, first person driving in my car. Yeah, put them on um, YouTube, for my on podcast. TikTok. Because I have a podcast. You do, Hot Pursuit. It's called Hot Pursuit. I highly recommend you check it out. In any case, $800 is what Ray-Ban wanted for those. When you factor in my progressive lenses. You don't have insurance that covers any of that? I don't think or is it that covers too all discretionary? of it. 800 is too much, I think. That's what you were making, though, also on NVIDIA being a big part of this story. I was pulled up that SPLC function that you were talking about, Microsoft being the top of that list, Meta being number two. And so if we're in this storyline where Meta is going to be rewarded, as Mandeep says, for bringing more 
more uh, more spending to the table. It's a great week to keep watching NVIDIA, isn't it? Yeah, the stakes are definitely high, of course, for all of these companies, even the ones that aren't reporting the NVIDIAs of the world, of course. A quick check on the stock market. We are seven minutes into this trading day. You can see green on the screen. You have small caps just making a run for it, up about 1%, up about half a percent when you take a look at those large cap indexes. A quick check on the cross-asset landscape here. You have 10-year yields relatively contained right now. I'm going to go ahead and call that flat. We know it's been a volatile time in the bond market, the absolute level quite high. You take a look at crude, a little bit more volatility there, down 6% after Israel attacked Iran with a strike, but of course limited those uh, to avoid the infrastructure when it comes, of course, to the oil facilities. And then you take a look at the VIX, currently trading at 19. All of that a setup to talk to Bandrian Capital President and CEO Shana Sissel sitting to my left. It's great to see you in person. Absolutely. Great to see you in person. So you join ahead of a consequential 10 days. We've been talking about it. You have earnings, you have the election, you have the jobs report, you have the Fed in there as well. When you think about the hair trigger that this market seems to be on, what are you paying the most attention to? The election. Yeah. By far and away, the election. All the other things are normal uh, business cycle, uh, things that occur, uh, economic data that we normally get. But the election is the most consequential because there are several surveys out there that have shown that businesses are holding off on making any decisions till they have some idea of what candidate is going to win because it really will affect the rules of the game, if you will. Speaking of that, we had a survey from MLive today that says that investors are largely thinking that a Donald Trump victory would be better for stocks. You know, some of that calculus is down to the corporate tax rate. But at the end of the day, you know, they do believe that stocks would go up either way. And so how do you parse that trade out, especially when you know that the market has been employing that Trump trade so heavily in the week up to election? Well, it's interesting because the, the, the polls show a virtual tie at this point. So where it goes is anybody's guess. But I will say this. We spend a lot of time thinking that certain candidates and certain uh, outcomes will be better for the stock market than others. But historically, it, it doesn't make that much of a difference, to be honest. Um, just having that certainty is the thing that sends stocks higher. Um, and it, it's less important who wins. Now, if you look back when Trump won in 2016, um, that did send the stock market higher, but that was a different environment than we are in today, where we've just seen the strength in the stock market all along. We're already up 22, 23%. Two years in a row. Yeah, exactly. A double 20% gains um, is pretty crazy. And I guess it's because we do have a lot more certainty than uh, we like to talk about, right? We know. No matter who wins the election, they're not going to cut spending. That's it's going to grow. The debt and deficits will rise. We have this new magic money tree, and <laughs> that's all the market cares about, right? Yeah, I'd like to tell my son that, right? Like, yeah. what do you think? There's a magic money tree in the backyard, and I can just pull up whatever you want, something. Uh, you know, the government is essentially doing the same thing. Um, I completely agree with you. Um, Are the bond vigilantes going to stand up to this at some point? I mean, does... This is what I wonder after the election, especially if you get a red sweep, right? Mm -hmm. Trump winning and Republicans taking the House. Does the bond market say, hang on a second here, we're going to raise rates on you a little bit? They kind of have to. Um, if you look at, I believe I was looking at a strategic piece the other day, and it showed that the, um, the, the cost of debt right now is about 3.6%, which is lower than any place on the yield curve right now. So they kind of have to come up to kind of meet where the curve is. So rates do have to come up, um, and that can be of concern. Um, my bigger question is, what's the Fed going to do? Because there's more strength in this economy than I think we'd like to give it credit for. And that puts the Fed in a difficult position. The job report from last month was unusually strong in the way that the Fed probably wasn't expecting. And I'm not convinced that inflation is completely under control just yet. I, I think the Fed has to be careful what they do at this point. Interesting. So it sounds like you think that we're not getting another 50 boy basis point rate cut or anything to that magnitude. With that backdrop, I mean, how do you p position in this market? You think about how you build a portfolio around these different cross currents, and there's so many of them. What's your conviction right now? So I just want to say, when they cut, uh, when they, um, cut 50 basis points, I thought that was an over overreaction. Mm -hmm. I never saw it coming. 
I will be the first one to admit you can watch me. Uh, you can see all of my <laughs> clips. I never predicted you that. You have the receipts. I have the receipts. I was wrong. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I, that surprised me. Now, that said, in this kind of environment where stocks and bonds are high, uh, behaving um, kind of in unison, um, I am a big fan of using alts. Mm. And Queen of alts, uh, uh, here with you today, <laughs> telling you I use alts. Big surprise. But I do think in this environment, having that diversification benefit really matters. So that's really where I'm, I'm spending the time. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking it more out of fixed income than I am out of equities. I think there's more upside opportunity in equities than in fixed income. I think fixed income has more questions. So that's where I'm kind of taking from in my portfolio to put into more alternative strategies. Shana, great having you on the program. Great having you on set. Thanks so much for joining us. Here in person, uh, Bonnery and Capital President and CEO Shana Sissel. Coming up, Volkswagen unveils plans to cut its expenses by shutting down factories and dropping wages. We're going to get Ford earnings later today as well. So talk about the cars next. This is Bloomberg. Volkswagen announced plans to cut expenses in an effort to become more competitive with China. The automaker plans to close at least three factories at its home in Germany, which is a huge deal, and cut all its workers' wages in its home country by 10 percent. That plan could lead to tens of thousands of job cuts in Europe's largest economy. Another car company looking to cut costs is Ford right here in America. They are set to report third quarter earnings after the bell. And here with a preview of that is Bloomberg's Keith Naughton in Detroit. Keith, it is uh, fascinating to watch the damage done to German automakers and the German economy by Chinese competition. Is it as bad here in the U.S.? Because you don't hear as much about uh, German cars at U.S. auto shows, uh, Chinese cars, I should say, at U.S. auto shows. Yeah, no, the Chinese threat in the United States remains just a threat. They're not here. You know, President Biden is putting 100 percent tariffs on Chinese EVs trying to come here. So we really don't have, um, you know, Chinese players here in the United States yet of any note. Um, in Europe, that's not the case. Uh, and, and the European automakers like VW, like Mercedes and BMW, it's a double threat for them because they have such large operations in China that are really under pressure uh, because of the growing competitiveness of the Chinese car makers. And then, of course, the Chinese car makers are going into Europe. So they have a sort of a two front war going. Let's talk about Ford a little bit more specifically. Of course, they report earnings after the bell. Matt, I know you are really dialed into what's going to happen there. You take a look at how uh, Ford has fared in the stock market. That big plunge at the end of July, of course, that's when they last reported earnings. Uh, of course, those warranty costs really eroding profit. That uh, led to the biggest drop in 15 years. And it's interesting that Ford shares really haven't recovered from that. We've kind of uh, flatlined since. What are you expecting to hear after the bell today? Yeah, well, I mean, there's going to be a keen focus on cost cutting. Uh, in addition to the warranty costs, which spiked by $800 million in the second quarter, and which Ford spent over $4 billion on last year fixing their customers' cars, uh, there's also a promise that they're going to cut just $2 billion in costs in general that was supposed to be backloaded to the second half of the year. So investors are really going to look to see that they've taken out the knives and cut these costs as promised. How can Ford, you know, from quarter to quarter, reduce warranty costs when those vehicles have already been designed, produced, sold for the most part? They're just coming back to the dealer um, to get fixes from mistakes made in the factory. Right. There's sort of near term and far term things they can do, Matt. In the near term, what uh, Farley is doing is he is holding new cars as they come out of the factory to give them extra quality checks. In the first half of the year, the F-150 had a refreshed new model, and there were cars all over Detroit here in holding lots as they went in and checked them, gave them extra checks for quality. Farley says that saved 12 recalls. They are the most recalled automaker in America. Um, but then long term, what they have to do is really fix the way they engineer and design the cars so you don't have these mistakes happening in the factory.
brutal statistic to be a part of. Bloomberg's Keith Naughton in Detroit. Of course, we will be eagerly awaiting those results after the bell. And coming up, we're going to talk about Robinhood rolling out betting contracts for events like next week's election. That's next in our Wall Street Beat. Robinhood shares on the rise. This is Bloomberg. And it's time now for the Wall Street Beat. Robinhood will let retail traders bet on the outcome of next week's presidential election. That's as it diversifies from traditional markets. The event contracts will be limited, and buyers will have to attest that they meet a variety of requirements, according to the company. Bloomberg's Catherine Doherty joins us now. And it's interesting to see them do this right before the election. Of course, there's been a lot of regulatory concerns about this world up until this point. They're also pairing up uh, in sorts with interactive brokers, they're utilizing IBKR's back end for trade routing. These used to be historic competitors. Why is this an opportunity for Robinhood at this juncture, and does it give them a serious opportunity with such a short time horizon into the election? So I don't think they're worried about the short time horizon. They are really trying to take advantage of the activity that other platforms, some of their competitors, have already seen um, and display that this is something that they can get into. Um, but really, the big question mark was the regulation around this. Um, and it's interesting because the CFTC has not changed its tune. It's still very concerned about the market interaction and this betting on the outcome of the election and w what possible ramifications it might have on the election itself and the integrity of the election. Now, when the court had reversed the stay that basically was preventing these types of betting to occur, that opened the floodgates. So that's why we're seeing Robinhood today make this announcement. Interactive Brokers was really the first registered big platform um, that started this wave. Uh, and it could be that even between now and next week, we see others that follow. Um, so it's, it's just who's going to be ready in the next few days. And it could be that there's still more things to bet on even after next week's election. Right. If things aren't resolved or there's still question marks of do you think yes or no and you can make bets expressing your view, right. there's probably even more trading that can occur. That's a great point because, I mean, uh, my first reaction reading this was, okay, this will be fun and useful for about eight days, but mm -hmm. of course we might not get a result by then. Uh, but talk just a little bit more about the regulation and how it might impact the timeline here because I don't know. I imagine that Robin Hood would have liked to have this out a month ago. But do we have a sense of whether uh, the regulatory overhang was a delay for this company? It does seem that way just based on the timing. Um, they, if they're launching a week out um, ahead of the election, they had everything really ready to go. Um, now, the regulators are having to then be what they say is the, the market cop, the election cop, as, as they say it. Um, and that's not because they, they want to necessarily have to, to, to maintain um, the oversight over the activity, um, but they're forced to because of the court's decision. Um, so this is their Robin Hood interactive brokers. These are platforms that the CFTC you know, is, is having to work with and mm -hmm. regulate. And so this is no different. One other way to look at this that I think is interesting, these are being treated as markets, like a stock and bond market would, not like a sports betting contract, which are regulated state by state. And so I think that's going to play out over the next couple of years. Clearly, the CFTC wants more control. It's pretty crazy, though, that they use interactive brokers tech. Right, this right is because a they're still rivalry. they're still competitors. Totally. I mean, um, don't they feel kind of weak using? I don't think the other so. Guys? I, I think that if if you think about the market as a whole, they probably see this as the more activity and the more that this can become a regular mainstream type of trading, and the more that all of their customers can get used to this. It's a benefit to to all parties. So but why not just use interactive brokers? I think that if you can make the the act of trading and betting on the outcome of elections, they, want it, they, they just want it to be a, a very common activity. We are 30 minutes into the trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And coming up, 
next 10 days could make or break a lot of things for investors. There's a slew of big earnings, a Fed decision, the election, and even more on the horizon. And from Starbucks to Southwest, Paul Singer's hedge fund has been busy hunting for turnaround targets, but now it's on the prowl for bigger prey. And it's the last full week of campaigning. Donald Trump enters the final stretch of the rally at Madison Square Garden, flanked by Elon Musk and Hulk Hogan. We'll uh, discuss, of course, the final sprint here, but let's get a check on these markets. As Matt said, we are 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day, and you can see uh, shares currently higher on the S&P 500, up about half a percent. The Nasdaq 100, it's interesting here, big tech giving back some of its early gains, still higher by about three-tenths of a percent ahead of a pivotal earnings week, but a little bit tepid. And then you can see the bond market pretty much flat on the day. Of course, there has been plenty of volatility to find in 10 year yield so a day of quiet at least for now meanwhile let's talk about positioning because after two straight weeks of net buying hedge funds net sold us stocks last week and reversed about a quarter of recently added long positions short selling in macro products which includes etf and indexes that was the largest since early january and it points to an increase in hedging activity natalia kunijevich is here with more Hi, Katie. Yeah, so these are these macro products, and we see that hedge funds sold them pretty aggressively last week. Especially this move, short selling, was especially pronounced across large cap, small cap, as well as energy ETFs. Now, on the flip side, we see that funds bought single stocks slightly last week, and one sector really stands out. This is healthcare. On a one month basis, this is now the most net bought US sector among hedge funds, of course. And this move is pretty much justified by earnings as well. We see strong results across healthcare stocks. And uh, Bloomberg Intelligence data shows us that that was uh, healthcare posted the second largest positive earnings surprise across all US sectors. You may wonder which one is the first. It's utilities. And this was also one of the most net bought sector by hedge funds last week. Of course, we want to know where hedge funds stand with technology. Yes, we see that they bought Infotech, they sold actually Infotech slightly last week. And uh, overall uh, exposure, net long exposure as a percentage of total exposure to all U.S. stocks is now at the lowest level since uh, May or June 2023. Uh, of course, traders want to know how stock prices can potentially move on earnings. And we have some data from Bloomberg Terminal, which shows average move uh, of each single stocks on, stock on earnings versus implied move, meaning what the market thinks may happen. And these are companies that report earnings this week. And we can clearly see that implied move for all stocks, Alphabet, Meta, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon, is lower the average move. This possibly suggests that traders are under position ahead of big tech earnings. I hear a lot from traders that call options, bullish call options on big tech are relatively cheap. And Matt, the biggest question is, of course, is this max seven trade over? All right, Natalia, thanks so much for joining us. Natalia Kenijevich there talking to us about hedge fund uh, positioning. Joining us now to talk more about the market and the coming election is Linda Dissel, Federated Hermes Senior Equity Strategist. And Linda, before we get into um, you know, the MAG-7 question that Natalia poses, I wonder your take on the election. It does seem that the market is positioned for a Trump win, certainly um, selling treasuries and not today, but over the course of time, bidding up the rate to four and a quarter percent. Um, why does the market think, think Trump is going to win, even though polls have uh, a, a statistical tie? Well, the, I guess the best answer I could give for that is that he is ahead of Harris at this point as versus where he was uh, versus Biden and then Clinton prior to that. So it seems as if the market believes he has a momentum going for him. And, uh, you know, and there's a lot of discussion about those polls and, you know, who answers the polls and who's afraid to say who they're going to vote for. But, but I think in general, the market is basically saying it would be happy if Trump wins in a, in a, uh, uh, 
in a sweep or if at least there's a divided government mm -hmm. and that there is very low odds that it would be a sweep for the Democrats. And I think that's just enough for the market to be bullish and to carry on here with the good earnings season. Well, let's talk a little bit more about those down ballot races, because it seems like that's where investors are really focusing a lot of their attention for the reason that you name, of course, uh, united government versus a divided government leads to very different outcomes. So what does the blueprint look like for a red sweep versus a blue sweep versus maybe just a division here? And, and when you say what is the blueprint, you, what are you asking? Like, how are you thinking about it? When you think about portfolio construction and you think about what the investment will be rather than the trade? Yes, yes. Um, if Trump were to win, the odds are pretty good that you would have a sweep. That's because we know that 80 percent of the population for the past, I think, 30 years just pulls the one, the, the one uh, lever and votes for one party all the way down. So that would argue that if Trump were to win, that he would bring along the House as well as the Senate. The highest conviction call being that the Senate will be flipped over to the GOP. And if that's the case, then the market would, would think that the worst that you could have if you were a conservative was a split government. And that would be OK, too. So as goes the Treasury market, you know, I've seen uh, suggestions as to allocation that say you shouldn't buy Treasuries because in both cases, you have a lot of spending you're looking forward to and no particular attention to the deficit reduction. So we take that kind of with a grain of salt. We know that a lot of the advisors we speak to, if Trump were to win, are worried about uh, about the tariff situation and his calls for across the board tariffs across the whole wide world. But the market doesn't seem to care about that as much because the market tends to believe he'll be targeted with that. So in general, the market is right now, and as you know, even the Nasdaq last week making new highs, you know, it's in a pretty good mood coming into the end of this year. Well, if you look at some parts of the market in particular, I think you hinted at it in the bond market, but you are seeing in the bond market, perhaps in the dollar, in certain industries, a Trump trade. And Linda, I'm really curious about what you're watching the night of the election. Which assets, uh, what stocks, what indexes that would give you a sense of the direction of travel uh, as we get the, the votes coming in for both the White House as well as Congress? Unfortunately, I think on election night, we're not going to probably know who won. And I also think we're getting used to that uh, here in the United States, where you have to wait a number of weeks to find out who actually won. So uh, what we'll be watching for is is returns coming in and um, and how quickly the expected returns. I think Virginia's being one of those where how quickly might Harris take over uh, and win. And if she doesn't, if they don't announce by nine o'clock at night, for example, that might mean a long night for her. That could potentially, I guess, move markets even further to Trump is going to pull this out. But Linda, it's really just. Mm -hmm. Linda, can I ask? So what I'm really wondering is, I'm sure you have a Bloomberg terminal. you got four screens up, right? You've got the election results on screen one. And then you can use each of your uh, remaining screens to put up an asset, bond, a currency, a stock. What other I'm financial assets are you going to be watching throughout the election night and, you know, continuing coverage? Right. If, if indeed Trump were to win, and particularly in a sweep, then uh, the small cap stocks, that, uh, that entire arena is still very inexpensive versus the rest of the market, almost historically still inexpensive. And so even as we've been overweight small cap growth, we've now added small cap value into that. Because the odds of a, of a recession now next year are pretty low, almost regardless of who wins this election. So we'll be watching for the small caps. The value trade, and we know that the utilities and the financial sectors have been very strong in the third quarter. But to see that expand. We're just talking this morning in our meeting about the banks, which are the first to report. They did well, and that's a, bear weather, a bellwether for the economy as well. But indeed, they're up, but not nearly as much up as they could be uh, when you look at the valuation. So you might look at the regional banks, for example, which will love it if it's a, if it's a Trump win and if it's a sweep uh, because of the thoughts to regulations, which have been really hurting the banking sector in this administration.
All right, so keep an eye on the little guys. Keep an eye, of course, on the financials and some of those value-oriented sectors. Let's talk a little bit about earnings and how it plays uh, into this market setup that we have ahead of us. Of course, we are getting into the heart of earnings. As you said, the banks were out with a pretty good showing a couple weeks ago. Now we have big tech, and a lot is on the line. What are you expecting from the Magnificent Seven, and how does that compare to what we're expecting from the rest of the 493? Well, you know, five of the seven of the mag sevens will report this week. I think that's 45% of the market is going to report this week. We come into it beating uh, what, what were the expectations so far so good. But obviously these are huge companies. And what we've noticed in terms of even the expectations is that the growth rate of those earnings, those strong, will be coming down a pace. And we've been noticing that in expectations pretty much all year long for this quarter, next quarter, first quarter into the following year, which argues that you can look to the other 493 and bid those up. But these companies are unlikely to disappoint or disappoint much. If anybody says something that really is surprising to the upside, that could really power this market to, uh, to make that strong finish to the year as it usually does because these are some of the biggest names could really move the entire market. Mm -hmm. And and the third quarter, they have been basically flat uh, so far as versus the rest of the market. Linda, it's a nice setup if mm -hmm. they very, were to- Very uh, quickly uh, here, there is less than one rate cut priced into markets right now for that November meeting after the election. There's Jobs Day on Friday, a lot of uncertainty ahead about the direction of travel. How much do interest rates matter to what is happening in the stock market right now? Well, it's very important to watch what the Fed does and what they say. Uh, they, they cut stronger than many thought at the first. They're likely to slow down, and they probably should slow down as we worry and watch for inflation maybe coming back to bite us. And the odds are excellent that they will do. So, uh, so that is what is to be expected. We don't really care the pace necessarily, but that they finish in and around 3% in 2026. Linda, great to get some time with you. Thanks so much. Um, for your info there, Linda Dissel of Federated Hermes giving us some intelligence ahead of this election. Coming up, Donald Trump rallies in the heart of Manhattan while K Kamala Harris brings out Beyonce. We'll take a look at the home stretch for both candidates next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get out of high interest to look at what's making headlines around the world. Volkswagen is planning to close at least three factories in Germany as it tries to slash expenses. Proposals to fix the struggling VW brand include a 10% wage cut and shrinking all the remaining sites in Germany. The plan underscores the crisis at Volkswagen, which has bungled a transition to electric vehicles and lost relevance in China, where it is losing market share. And J.P. Morgan Chase is warning that the U.S. faces significant strains on its water supply that could eat into corporate valuations thanks to artificial intelligence. The growth of AI requires a vast amount of water to cool power-hungry data centers. Large data centers can use up to 5 million gallons of water a day. In a report published today, the firm says a mishandling of uh, water risk could cause real disruptions to global supply chains. And Donald Trump held a marathon rally right here in the heart of Manhattan, flanked by Elon Musk and Hulk Hogan, as well as Dr. Phil. Trump's event at the Madison Square Garden lasted for nearly six hours on Sunday. It featured criticisms of Vice President Kamala Harris over the border, crime, and the economy. I think one person referring to her as the Antichrist, Shanali. Um, certainly a lot going on when it comes to the election. We just have eight days left, Matt. We are joined now by Bloomberg Politics editor Laura Davison. Want to talk about really the efforts by the candidates to get out there because, of course, you had uh, pre former President Trump in Manhattan in a Democratic stronghold, really trying to bring many more voters on in places that have not typically gone red. At the same time, you had had early voting out in many swing states. What do we know about the direction of travel so far? 
Yeah, so we know that um, from this early voting data that at least in some key swing states that report partisan uh, affiliation of voters, uh, we know that um, Republicans have been voting in slightly higher numbers than Democrats. Um, you know, we don't know how this, uh, how those people voted. Uh, you know, we don't know if they voted for Trump or uh, or Harris. But it suggests that Republicans who had been really wary of early voting because of the messages that they were getting from Trump and the party, um, you know, have sort of shrugged off uh, those those initial. Uh, you know, that was really a theme of 2020. This year, uh, you know, they're going out and voting early. That is, you know, potentially a good sign for Repub Republicans in that you're locking in those votes. And then also once those people vote, the campaign knows who are the voters they still need to target. Trump in particular is going after low propensity voters, particularly young men. And that's why you see him uh, going to some unusual spots like on the Joe Rogan podcast uh, late last week. Um, also this uh, Madison Square Garden rally. He's trying to break in sort of through national media channels, uh, not necessarily being in swing states, but going to places uh, that he thinks will resonate and, you know, pick up, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, hints from people who are not necessarily watching political news day in and day out. And we were saying that, of course, the Madison Square Garden rally was a marathon. Being on the Joe Rogan podcast is also a marathon. That's a multi-hour commitment. A lot of people listen to it, though, to your point. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with the Kamala Harris campaign, where, of course, she's expending energy. Of course, she campaigned in Houston with Beyonce over the weekend. Beyonce did not perform, as I understand, and uh, there were a few people upset about that. Yeah, this is uh, sort of the second time that Harris fans have been a little bit disappointed. There were rumors uh, before the head of the Democratic National Convention that Beyonce would be there. Uh, you know, that didn't turn out to be the case. You know, again, uh, you know, then Beyonce did come out and appeared at this event, just spoke, however, and, and didn't perform. Um, you, you, you see Harris um, really leaning into a lot of these celebrities. She does have some musical appearances uh, planned for later in the week, uh, you know, with uh, campaigning with different, uh, you know, uh, musicians, Maggie Rogers, uh, Mumford & Sons. Uh, so this is something that her campaign has been doing to sort of gin up enthusiasm. Uh, going forward, you'll see her blitzing across all of the swing states, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, out in the southwest and Arizona and Nevada as well, all over the next several days. In terms of um, the betting markets having Trump with a big lead, Laura, and Wall Street seeming to bet big on Donald Trump, why do you think that is when polls are so closely tied? Yeah, so betting markets and polls fundamentally measure different things. Uh, you know, polls are looking at, you know, at uh, registered voters or are now uh, likely voters in some of these swing states. Betting markets, you're looking at more sort of investors on where they're willing to, uh, you know, put money on the outcome. You know, of course, betting markets can be swayed. Also, polls, uh, you know, are a tool that show a snapshot in time and not, you know, sort of predictive of, a, of an outcome. And there are margins of the errors with polls as well. So both of these are different tools that tell us uh, sort of directionally where things are going. Um, you know, I think it is still very clear um, that this is a close race, um, and you know we'll get some more data going forward. Uh, you know, but, uh, these betting markets are still a relatively new tool. Um, so after a couple cycles, we'll get a sense of you know kind of what uh, you know the movement in those markets mean and how much we can rely on them for predictive outcomes. Laura, we thank you so much for your time and your reporting. That is Laura Davison in Washington. Like we said, eight days to go, a lot to keep an eye on, and still ahead, some schools are just saying no to crux. Social climbers, we'll talk about what's going on next. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves this morning. And first up, Alaska Air getting a boost after an upgrade from Melius Research. The firm says that the carrier can quickly digest and fix the fundamentals of Hawaiian Airlines. Next up, dozens of schools in at least 12 U.S. states have forbidden students from wearing Crocs. The schools say that some students trip and fall while wearing these colorful clogs without the straps behind the heel. And you have other schools saying that the shoes have led to a rise in distractions, including students playing with the little charms that go with the shoes in class and throwing the shoes at their classmates. It sounds a lot of fun. Uh, finally, though, let's talk about the $70 billion activist hedge fund Elliott Management chasing some big prey. It's gone after a number of high profile companies, including Starbucks, Tesla Instruments, Southwest and Etsy, a long list there. And it's been so successful in these past few years that chasing the small fry companies, it's not even worth the hassle anymore. And Bloomberg News, of course, wrote a great in-depth profile of Paul Singer's 
47-year-old firm, Shanali. Yeah, it's really interesting. If you look at the bets that Elliott has made this year, of course, there are some that have paid off big. Texas Instruments still up more than 20%. Etsy, though, still down more than 40%, guys. And you do see Elliott winning board representation. The most interesting example lately, of course, is Southwest because they were ready. And this profile by Bloomberg's Kathy Burton and Crystal Say really gets into how they were preparing right. for a fight here. So, you know, uh, them being able to win those board seats right away uh, and not get into a larger battle here has been an interesting feature of their current fight. There has been some compromise. You know, Bob Jordan got to keep his job, at least as CEO, but uh, definitely a coup to get those board seats. And uh, it's interesting that Southwest just bent here. And Elliott, of course, got to avoid the proxy fight as well. Yeah, Starbucks is interesting, too. You can see that it's kind of a long way to go still, only up about 3% this year. You saw a big move there and a lot of uh, accolade when Elliott saw the CEO switch over. But, of course, uh, these fights are still a long way to go. Uh, they're more vocal now when you consider how other activists have behaved in the market lately, many of them more privately. Bill Ackman won't come out anymore, for example, and make big public He's retired. Again. He's retired, his words, right. Yeah. Uh, and even on the short side, a lot of those activist short sellers a little less loud. You think about just a week ago, we spoke to David Einhorn, uh, not vocally announcing shorts anymore. So they kind of stand alone here uh, in this kind of a way when they're attacking corporate America. So who's the biggest prey? I mean, Starbucks and Texas Instruments are already pretty big. Right, right, exactly. And yeah. I think what comes next might be more interesting because the point here is they get bigger and bigger, guys. All right, a uh, lot to keep an eye on there. Great profile by our Bloomberg News colleagues. Make sure to check it out. This is Bloomberg. We're talking a lot about big tech this week. Of course, it's a big earnings week, but let's talk about big tech in relation to real estate. We have the perfect guest to do so, Elizabeth Hart. She is Newmark president of Leasing for North America. Hart, of course, is one of the world's foremost experts on commercial real estate, completing over $4 billion worth of deals in her career. It's great to see you, Liz. Thank you for having me. So we have some recent examples about big tech looking into offices. Of course, you had OpenAI a couple weeks ago uh, opening their first New York City office. A report from the New York Post today about Amazon and talks to lease space on Fifth Avenue. And I'm curious, from where you're sitting, the perch that you have, do you see more of these big tech companies actually bucking the trend when it comes to office and looking to actually sign some new leases here? Absolutely. We're tracking 100 million square feet of demand right now. 15% of that is technology companies and 30% are in growth mode. So um, are they focused as much on L.A. or are they expanding a lot more out to New York, out to London, out to Berlin? Well, I think San Francisco would be the heart of Silicon Valley with artificial intelligence. So that's where we're seeing the most demand from these companies. I meant San Francisco. You know what? To me, <laughs> L.A., San Francisco, it's, it's the same there. thing. You're, you're it's, not wrong, Matt. It's because over LA, in California. L.A. also has an increase in right. artificial intelligence companies specifically. But Silicon Valley, San Francisco, that's the heart of it. And then growing into New York City, D.C., and Seattle, and Boston. You know, one thing I find interesting is how much space these companies are willing to take on. There's a lot of conversation around whether they want all their people back in the office, whether they'll have more remote jobs, whether they're looking at talent across the country here. So when you're looking at these new tenants take on the space, is it as much as the prior tenants had been? Well, it really depends on the stage of growth that that company is at. So for especially artificial intelligence companies, we're really seeing our first growth companies take on space, where they're sort of later stage and are scaling. Those are the open AI examples that you gave earlier today. But there's also many early stage companies that are you know, 50 people or so, or even 10 people that are incubating new ideas. Um, overall, the trend is that they're taking slightly less space than the platform development companies in 2008 to 10, but it's quite minor. And the number of companies continues to grow. When you take out your crystal ball and you look into the future, obviously big tech moving into offices uh, in a big way right now, what do you think demand five, 10 years from now looks like? I think that we'll see technology companies return to the demand that it was in a more pre-COVID era as a part of the total. So right now, financial services still outpaces technology. I think you'll see technology firms start to be more on par with them probably by the end of next year and early 2026. 
And you mentioned that 15% uh, figure when it comes to big tech. I mean, how does that compare to the last several years? I know that the pandemic made things weird in a lot of senses, but what's the historical context here? So what we're seeing is that the, the throughput, the actual transactions that are completed, are a little bit light compared to the historic, but the demand and who are tracking from tenants in the market, that's increasing. And so we'd expect that you would get it back to what it was you know, closer to 2018-19. I think it's interesting that you see it returning to a pre-pandemic level or even more since for one thing AI shouldn't that mean you need fewer people in your office and then for another <laughs> do the robots need a desk? I mean don't workers increasingly demand um, a large portion of their work be able to be done from home yeah there's a couple interesting things around that yeah. first of all the demand that we're seeing in San Francisco and New York is at pre-pandemic levels mm -hmm. so even if the vacancy and availability is higher the demand is coming back which is a good positive signal for the future and then as it relates to being in the office particularly artificial intelligence companies are actually increasingly in the office and part of that is they want to boost their employees productivity and what better way to hack it than have it in the office hack so <laughs> so work so work from home you Get like that. that you like that Pond. Work from home is not uh, playing a big role, you think, in um, the way we do things in five or ten years. I think work from home will play a role, but increasingly the office is playing a bigger role than it was two or three years ago when right. we were in the middle of the pandemic. And what we've seen is that the expectation between employers and, and employees is stabilizing at about three days a week, which would mean you know, majority of the time back in the office. You know, when you talk to a lot of investors, you still hear, fine, you're coming off the bottoms in commercial real estate, but it's still pretty tough out there. And if you think about the places that are more difficult to be occupied, where are you seeing the most struggle still? I think we're still seeing the most struggle in sort of that B minus building, stuff that doesn't have very strong amenities. The trophy category continues to outperform and we'd expect that to continue. But we're also seeing a lot of buildings that are being renovated and they're doing everything they can to really increase their position in the market and start to reach for those trophy rates. Right, if you want a trophy rate, what do you have to do to the building to make it attractive once again? What kind of investment do you have to make? You know, how many kombucha bars do you have to have <laughs> for, for the AI talent to want to come back in? Well, you have to hire Newmark, that's number one. But then after that, I think I think the big thing we're seeing is you know a very big push towards activating the ground plane that's why retail is so important in the office environment is having something that really attracts employees in coffee bars amenities etc there is a really good thing I think um, generally we're leaning away from ping pong and we're getting more into productivity hacks like having plants in your space which boost your productivity and other things like that are really pro productivity focused all right plants. Liz. that's a low bar well, yeah, I like the days of ping pong you know? tables you know <laughs> ping pong and plants Ping pong and plans. There you go. Liz, it's great to see you. Really appreciate you stopping by, of course, joining us on set. That is Liz Hart of Newmark. Meanwhile, let's go check on these markets. We're about an hour into the U.S. trading day. We're still higher, of course, hanging on to these gains after a pretty brutal showing last week. The S&P 500 currently higher by about half a percent. Big tech, it was your leader. It's not anymore. The Nasdaq 100 higher by about four-tenths of a percent. We know we have a big slate of earnings. It'll be fascinating to watch that line in particular over the course of this week. And then you take a look at the bond market. Yields up slightly, just about one basis points or so. We are hanging out at about 425 on the 10-year yield, Shanali. We're going to get a check on some of those stocks moving under the surface. We're going to bring in for that Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter, Denitza Sekova. Yeah, let's go back to Boeing. Obviously, the big news of today, 19 billions of share sales, uh, something we've rarely seen from public company. Uh, obviously, Boeing is trying to maintain their investment grade uh, status. What we're seeing so far is the, ne the reaction is quite negative. The stock was down more than 2%. Now, obviously, some of that is reversed. But if we zoom out and we look at the year-to-date loss, we're talking about more than 40%, really one of the worst years for the company on record. Uh, we have a new CEO who's dealing with strained balance sheets, workers on a strike for seven weeks, and, of course, uh, crippling revenue from their 737 Mac jet. So a lot to look for whether we can see a rebound from this really, really tough year. We were talking about Robinhood uh, earlier in the Wall Street beat. They're adding technology to allow trading on uh, I, I can't say betting, but trading on election who they think. Election contracts. Election yeah. contracts on who they think. Essentially betting on who you think is going to be president. Yes, they're adding election contracts. And what a timely what a, what a timely thing to do. We know Interactive Brokers already has that feature. Uh, but uh, Robinhood has been in a big expansion. And the reaction is really good. We saw more than 4% 
earlier today. We also remember that last week NYC um, said that they're looking into 22 hours Ugh. of stock trading, no. which, you know, we, we, we immediately think about Robin Hood, we think about retail traders and people who have been pushing for this for quite some time. So obviously investors are a, a more bullish on the company when you add that uh, on top of the election betting. 22 hours a day. Uh, I don't look forward to that future, but it's a great way for exchanges to make more money. Uh, let's bring it home here and talk about Ford, of course, reporting after the bell. And as we were discussing earlier, it's been a really rough ride since late July. It's been a very rough ride. You remember the last earnings we got was a huge disappointment for the market. We saw a uh, very big loss. Uh, what we're seeing now, it's actually analysts are expecting a pretty good quarter. Uh, it's the estimate is 45 billion uh, and uh, 46 cents per share. Uh, what we're seeing actually is that Deutsche Bank is saying that estimates are pretty elevated. Um, so even uh, what we're seeing today, the little uptick and investor optimism, could potentially be disappointed if we see a miss uh, on the earnings uh, and the company is down 8% this Denise, year. Uh, let's also check in on DJT. This is a Trump Media and Technology Group. It was up 7% to start the day. It's up more than 15% now. Yes, what a day. Uh, obviously, we we talked earlier about the Trump trade that has been doing well for quite some time, uh, which you can imagine has been closely correlated with what we see uh, in uh, DJT. And obviously, we had another rally just now. Uh, and uh, it seems like uh, this company is very closely uh, correlated with election sentiment. And of course, uh, if you look at the volumes, they're very elevated. There is a lot of retail activity. There is a lot of uh, uh, potentially speculation there. So the moves are really, really extreme on the, uh, both uh, sides of the spectrum. <laughs> Absolutely. Officially quadrupled from the lows of this year. This stock. But, but not up to the high. I'm looking not at the chart the right now. Not $45 to, no. right now. We were in March at 66 yeah, true. Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's funny that, of course, we're not even talking about the company's fundamentals. But that's does thin. it have fundamentals? It's thin gruel. What it's, is the there's company not much actually to talk do? About. It's just Truth Social. It's got or? Truth Social. You know, okay. less about fundamentals, more about momentum in this market. I, I got to check out that that website. All right, yeah. Denita, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Denita Tsakova talking to us about some of the stocks that are moving uh, in the stock market this morning. And since this is uh, the opening bell show, that's what we cover. Coming up, a story about our national defense spending for. Former Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense John Hamra discusses the department's efficiency or lack thereof. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our daily Wall Street Week conversation. And the U.S. spends more on defense than any other country. But is it using the money wisely? David Weston spoke with former Deputy Secretary of Defense John Hamry about how the Pentagon needs to reform its spending as technology changes modern warfare. We spend an enormous amount of money. Um, and we have the best military in the world. Is it sufficient for all of the problems we have? No. Um, but that's why we have alliances and that's why we uh, partner with other countries. Uh, we, we cannot do everything in the world on our own. Uh, as I said, we spend a lot of money uh, and we do have a fine military, but it's an extremely inefficient system that we have to buy things and, uh, and the way we're organized. An efficient way of buying things. Are we buying the right things? Because technology clearly is changing warfare. Well, um, you're right. Technology is changing warfare. And we're watching the war in Ukraine. And it's opening up entirely new concepts of warfare that we're going to have to really figure out. And I don't think we quite yet know how to do that. But we do have... Uh, a very good system for looking into the future and designing weapons for that future. And if you look at performance on the battlefield, all of the winning systems Ukraine has are ours. You know, it's, it's MLRS, it's uh, ATACMs, it's the M1 tank, the, the M2 Bradley is a superhero on the battlefield. So our systems are good. But the question is, for the future of war, 
um, are we moving fast enough and, and adaptive enough to accommodate these breaking technologies? And I think the jury's out on that. We hear a lot about asymmetric warfare uh, involving things like drones. Uh, is there a different form of asymmetry that technology is introducing, and that is that it is easier to attack than to defend, more expensive to defend than to attack? Uh, well, it's always been uh, more expensive to defend. Um, and uh, and I, I <clears throat> but we are oriented towards quickly winning the battle on the battlefield. Uh, we are not well organized to for sustained long-term conflict. Uh, it, we would it, it would really be a strain for us to manage a three-year war. Uh, our, we, we tend to buy too few weapons for long-term warfare. Our industrial base is sluggish. Um, it's not that the companies aren't willing to produce, but uh, the government isn't willing to give them resources for uh, surge capacity. So uh, we, 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 could, we could fight a terrific short-term war, but if we had a prolonged war, it would be a challenge. And that was John Hamry speaking with David Weston. Of course, you can catch Wall Street Week every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. This is Bloomberg. Just over one week until the election, and inflation remains one of the top issues for voters heading to the polls. Bloomberg's editor-in-chief emeritus Matt Winkler in his latest column argues that although Americans say they don't like paying the current level of prices for goods and services, the elevated prices narrative has passed its sell-by date. Matt Winkler joins us now live here on set. Matt, um, a fascinating column. You reference a porterhouse steak at a, uh, I think, Weiss Market in Pennsylvania. Uh, being $7.99 a pound. And I actually have had a similar experience at my local shop, right? I've been getting salmon this week for $7.99 a pound, which is an incredible deal compared to how much usually is like $12.99. Um, so food prices have been coming down by a number of different measures. That's absolutely correct. I mean, look, the pandemic did in fact cause all kinds of supply disruptions. It took a while to resolve those disruptions. But there's a reason why a lot of economists say excluding food and energy because they're typically or historically volatile. And so if you go to the supermarket this month, uh, you will get meat at a price that is below what you had to pay at all during the pandemic and is now comparable to what you paid in 2018, 2017, 2016. The same thing true, by the way, gasoline at the pump. You know, uh, in New Jersey, you can get gasoline, hard to believe this, at less than $2.80 a gallon. And, and pumped for you. Yes, I and always pumped say. for you. <laughs> right. So if you are an American in any of the states that you mentioned in your column here, why do you feel like there's such a huge disconnect between what they're experiencing at the grocery store, at the pump, and how they feel about the economy? So sad to say, I think it's on us. What I mean by that is, you know, when gasoline was $5 a gallon, the easiest story for every news organization to write is to send the reporter to the gasoline station and ask the reporters to ask everybody how they feel. And of course they felt terrible because it was $5 a gallon. They stopped assigning that story when gasoline came down. So you don't see any stories about the price of gasoline where it is today, nor about food or anything else. And so it's a bit of an echo chamber, if you like. If you don't hear about and read about the fact that what you're paying for stuff is a lot less than what you were paying just a year and a half ago, well, you might think things are still bad. So that's one part of the equation. It's just that people are not reminded over and over again that prices, in fact, for many things are a lot less than what they were just 24 months ago. And there's a lot of truth to that point, but just to push back, I mean, you talk about the elevated prices narrative, and there's this idea, of course, that you think about the absolute level of prices, even though the rate of change has slowed down, the absolute level is much higher than it was four years ago, and that's why people still feel like this, because their wages haven't kept up. But they have, actually. I mean, that's the thing. Wages have made a huge difference. And as we say uh, in our reporting in this column, 
uh, the affordability, and that's the key thing, the affordability of food is now the lowest since 2020. So, in fact, wages have increased far more, actually, than the price of stuff. Right. And so if you subtract that, you get a surplus. Right. We had a great chart showing this, and it's, I have gone back and forth with Matthew Bosler trying to figure this out, and you lay it out, that food now costs... Um, I think 7.44% of the average consumer's spending. And it had been up in the double digits, right. but it has now recovered substantially. It's also that companies aren't talking about inflation nearly as much, right? I think um, you cited Russell 3000 earnings reports. The uh, mentions of inflation have dropped by 78%. And uh, University of Michigan has lower uh, uh, concerns about inflation going forward. Um, there's also a Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, survey that shows consumers aren't as concerned about it going forward. So it's really dropped as, as an issue. Yeah, all of that's true. And by the way, you know, thanks to our colleagues at Bloomberg Artificial Intelligence, we can see that inflation just isn't in the narrative to the extent that it was, say, in 22. Uh, but there's another there's another uh, thing that's going on here, which is really important, and that is that um, people everywhere are able to uh, buy goods and services uh, in an economy that has been growing three percent annually, you know, since coming out of the pandemic. That's the best performing economy in the world by far. Um, you know, to have unemployment the lowest since the 1960s. And in other words, people who want a job have a job. And at the same time, they're getting wage increases. This is a really good economy. And unfortunately, that just is not getting through to people. I, I want to talk about something that's fairly unrelated <laughs> to the markets I and wanted you to, I wanted economics. to see the segue. Well, here's the thing. I think a lot of people on Wall Street, a lot of people in industry, a lot of people in government, we know Jerome Powell, a are big fans on this set. of the Grateful Dead. And I am, obviously, as well. I saw my first concert at Buckeye Lake in 1991, and you had already started Bloomberg News um, with Mike Bloomberg. But one of the reasons that I came here, I was also applying at Commerzbank and Allianz and some other firms, is that someone said, hey, Matt Winkler, who's the editor-in-chief, is a deadhead. So... What do you think about the passing of Phil Lesh on Friday? He was a huge trucking. driver. Trucking. The you economy? Can hear, you can hear the bass huh. yeah. in trucking. Okay. And y yeah, okay. But here's the thing, and you would love this because we're all at Bloomberg. August 9th, 1995. A sad day in the world. Jerry Garcia passed at a very young age of uh, 53. And you don't know this because you're all too young <laughs> to remember it. But the entire Bloomberg system froze because everybody had to read the same story at the same time. And we talk about every problem as an opportunity. We as a Bloomberg entity company learned a great deal from that about how we had to increase our capacity. But we can thank the Grateful Dead for that. All right. We can thank them for so much more. Uh, Matt, great to have you here with us on set. Thanks so much for uh, the column. Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief Emeritus Matt Winkler writing uh, about inflation and talking a little bit about the passing of Phil Lesh on Friday. He was a huge driver of the band. Um, the economy is trucking along as well, but he was also a big driver of the band's charitable causes and reminding everyone to tell your neighbor that you want to be an organ donor. Um, so. That's maybe this is a moment to do that as well. That's it for our program today. Bloomberg Tech is up next. This is Bloomberg TV.